It is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's webinar, Mission and Advocacy to Support Refugees. This is a church-wide webinar made available throughout the country for congregations and dioceses and individuals to learn how you can respond to the current refugee crisis. A few housekeeping items before we get started with our content. This webinar is being recorded and after the fact will be posted to our Vimeo account, which is vimeo.com slash refugees. All of our audience members will be kept in mute throughout the presentation to ensure that audio quality is as high as we can make it. Throughout this webinar, we will be live tweeting using the handles at EMM Refugees and at the EPPN and using the hashtag Refugees Welcome. So please, if you are on Twitter, tweet along with us. We would really love to see some buzz happening in social media. At the end of the webinar, we will be taking questions. So please use the question function, which is one of your drop-down menus in your toolbar to submit questions. Please introduce yourself. We'll take them throughout the webinar, and then we will field the questions at the end. We'd also love to know if you're meeting with a group at your congregation, perhaps you're hosting a watch party in your home, please send us through the questions pane information about what congregation you represent in what diocese and how many people are watching with you. We would love to know how many eyeballs are with us this evening. And finally, if you have any technical issues, you can use the chat function at the bottom of your toolbar or the questions function, and Wendy Johnson will help you out. Hi, I'm going to go ahead and introduce myself. I'm Lacey Bromel, the Manager for Online Communications and Operations in the Office of Government Relations. I'm a native of Nashville, Tennessee, and I've been living in D.C. working for the Office of Government Relations for just over two years. Uh, it's an honor to be with you tonight. Thank you so much. And you heard from me a moment ago. My name is Allison Duval, and I serve as the Manager for Church Relations and Engagement for Episcopal Migration Ministries, which is the Refugee Resettlement Service of the Domestic and Foreign Missionary Society. I live and work from the Diocese of Lexington in Kentucky, and very glad to be with you tonight. Thanks for being here. And I'm Wendy Johnson. I am the Communications Manager for Episcopal Migration Ministries. I live and work in the great state of Minnesota. And I will be the person behind the scenes working the chat and the questions. And then I'll be at the end, I'll be reading your questions back to everyone. So thank you for joining us. And uh, my name is Patricia Kisare. I am the legislative representative for international policy, uh, jointly serving the advocacy ministry of the Episcopal Church and the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Uh, in my work, I'm, I focus mainly on anti-poverty policies related to food security, uh, global health, economic participation, uh, and women and girls uh, issues, uh, as well as humanitarian assistance. Thank you for joining. Our colleague Jen Smyers is going to be joining us here shortly. She's having a few technical difficulties, but we're so excited to have Jen with us. She is the Director of Policy and Advocacy for Church World Service Immigration and Refugee Program and has a long and storied history in the work of advocacy in this field. We're honored to have her with us, both of um, the Office of Government Relations and Episcopal Migration Ministries partner closely with Church World Service and with other agencies in the work of Refugee Resettlement Service and Advocacy. You'll really enjoy having her with us. So just to give you a brief overview of the organizations that are represented tonight, the Domestic and Foreign Missionary Society is the legal and canonical name under which the Episcopal Church conducts mission. And in the Domestic and Foreign Missionary Society, we have many teams and departments, two of which are represented tonight, Episcopal Migration Ministries, as well as the Office of Government Relations in Washington, D.C., which incorporates our public policy advocates who advocate policy that has been passed by the General Convention through resolutions to our federal legislature, legislators, as well as the Episcopal Public Policy Network, which is a grassroots 
<clears throat> organization of Episcopalians that Lacey will tell you about a little bit later. As Patricia said, she serves a joint role serving the Episcopal Church and the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. So this is one of the ways in which we live into our full communion partnership and relationship with the ELCI. And then we're also partnering with Church World Service for this tonight as well. So the agenda at a glance, just to give you an idea of the ground we're going to cover in the webinar. We'll first start with objectives. What do we hope you will learn and be able to take away from tonight's presentation? We'll move into definitions. We will discuss the global refugee crisis, including its root causes and push factors. We'll look at the durable solutions in the resettlement countries coming to the United States. We'll delve into the basics of the United States Refugee Admissions Program, or the USRAP. And we'll look at the Episcopal Migration Ministries and how it functions as a ministry of the Episcopal Church, but also as a national refugee resettlement agency, working alongside eight other national agency partners. Then we'll shift gears away from this uh, great depth and breadth of information, and we'll talk about the real reason we're all here tonight. How can you help? We decided to proceed with this webinar and make this available widely. <clears throat> because we heard from so many across the church that they want to get involved in whatever way can be helpful to serve and welcome any refugee population. So we want to give you those tools. We'll talk about advocacy. We'll talk about mission and service and how you can give. And we'll finish up the evening with questions and answers. Our objectives. By the end of tonight's webinar, you should be able to fairly comfortably define the following terms, refugee, asylum seeker, and internally displaced person, and understand the basics of international protections for these vulnerable populations. You will appreciate the complexity of the global refugee crisis, the many populations that are affected, the push factors, as well as the significant burden that refugee hosting countries face and the responsibility of refugee resettlement countries to be part of the response. You'll have an awareness of the many actors involved internationally as well as domestically who are involved in refugee response and resettlement. You'll understand how to be involved in advocacy and how to join the Episcopal Public Policy Network, and you will have the tools to begin to explore how you, individually and collectively, as a member of an organization, a congregation, or another community group, can be involved in this work of welcome. So to begin with definitions, who is a refugee? The term and the meaning of refugee comes to us from the 1951 Geneva Convention relating to the status of refugees, was further defined in the 1967 protocol relating to the status of refugees. Refugees are persecuted and flee their homeland on the basis of their, their membership in a particular group, their religion, their nationality, their race. And importantly, their home governments are unable or unwilling to offer them protection. Refugees have fled across an international border, and their home countries are unable to provide them protection from their persecutors, and are oftentimes the persecutors themselves. When some refugee populations flee, it's generally evident why they have fled. This is true of the case of the Democratic Republic of Congo, of the Sudan, of the Syrian, the Syrian refugee crisis. And in those cases, refugee status is conferred on an entire population prima facie. For other individuals who flee their country to escape persecution and cannot seek the protections of their government, they cross the border and they are an asylum seeker. Then they go through a process called refugee status determination, which is adjudicated by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, or UNHCR. So asylum seekers have a claim of asylum. Once it is adjudicated and they receive refugee status determination, they are recognized by the UNHCR and by the country of first asylum as refugees. Internally displaced persons are often more vulnerable than refugees. They have fled their home, but not yet their country. They've been uprooted by conflict or violence or war. 
persecution, but they've not yet been able to cross an international border. So there aren't as many protections available to them, and often they're still in the same situation near the same source of persecution that caused them to flee. So they're highly vulnerable. And finally, we've seen in the media recently the term migrant used to describe some of the individuals fleeing into, into Europe. Migrants encompass all individuals who cross borders, but importantly, migrants who do not fall into the categories of refugee or asylum seeker can still seek out the protections of their home government. Um, a migrant might travel to reunite with family or for employment or for education, but critically, they can still seek the protection of their home government. Refugees and asylum seekers are not able to. The current global refugee crisis by the numbers. As you well know and have likely read, this is the largest refugee crisis we have seen since World War II. More than 60 million refugees, asylum seekers, and internally displaced people are in the world today. Of that 60 million, 20 million are refugees, and half of all refugees are children. Of that 20 million, 4 million have escaped the war in Syria. And I heard today in a news report that that number is nearing 5 million. So that country, which used to host many refugees, has now become the greatest producer of refugees. These are the largest numbers of forced migration we have seen since World War II. You can see in the last decade from this graphic how quickly the numbers of refugees, asylum seekers, and IDPs have increased. This graph ends in 2013, so just imagine 2015, the numbers are well off the chart. And these pie charts show the breakdown of refugees and internally displaced persons by country of origin. It's important to know that there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence of the proportion of refugees and IDPs to the proportion of those populations that are resettled through the United States Resettlement Program. And now I'm going to be turning it over to my colleague, Patricia Casare, who's going to walk us through the root causes and the push factors of this refugee crisis. Great. Um, at this time, I would like for us to step back and examine some of the factors uh, that have led to the current global refugee crisis. There are three main contributing factors uh, that has forced people to, to seek refuge elsewhere. The first one is civil wars. The second one is uh, pervasive human rights violations that threaten human security. And a third one is gang violence. I would like to note here that this is not an exhaustive list of contributing factors but rather a selection of the main ones. So similar to past trends, civil wars continue to be a major push factor in the current refugee crisis. Many of us are aware of the ongoing conflict in Syria, which has been getting a lot of uh, media attention, and rightly so. Uh, and refugees from Syria at the moment uh, encompasses half of the population crossing the Mediterranean. Uh, as you would recall from 2011, there was a series of anti-government protests across the Middle East, including in Syria. Uh, this is often referred to as the Arab Spring. So the Arab Spring uprising did not go over well with the Syrian government. And the Syrian government then responded uh, using military force and other extreme measures against the protesters. As a result, a civil war broke out, and that war continues today. And because of this situation, many Syrians are leaving the country to find safety elsewhere. So that is uh, an example of a civil war situation that is pushing uh, citizens um, to seek refuge elsewhere. 
Conflicts in both South Sudan and Sudan are also forcing people to flee their homes. So the conflict in South Sudan started raging in December of 2013 as a result of a power struggle between President Pierre, who is the current president, and his former deputy. Um, they were in a disagreement uh, in terms of how the government should run. And um, President Kier decided that he didn't want the vice president to remain in that position. Uh, through that experience, different factions uh, were formed, uh, sometimes across ethnic lines of the, of the leaders. And fighting then broke out. Uh, today, thousands of civilians have been killed. And the UN approximates that 2 million people have been forced to flee their homes. Uh, many of them are in uh, camps that are run by the United Nations uh, within South Sudan. In Sudan, uh, and let me note here as well that uh, for some of you who may not recall this, uh, South Sudan and Sudan are separated as different countries in 2011. Uh, so they are now two separate countries. But South Sudan is a very nascent country and it's already experiencing uh, all these different uh, conflicts within its, its new borders. Uh, going to, to, the north, uh, to the north side, which is Sudan, uh, you have an on ongoing civil war in Darfur region, which has been um, ongoing for many years now. And there is also conflict in the Kordofan area of, of Sudan. Uh, there are different uh, conflicts that erupt at different times, but it has been one of the areas that we often referred to as a hot spot in that region. So all these different conflicts within South Sudan and Sudan has forced many, many of the people from the Sudans uh, to flee to either neighboring countries uh, such as Ethiopia, Kenya. But some of these uh, refugees make their way to uh, Europe through uh, North Africa. So many of them uh, go all the way to Libya and then uh, they get on the boat to cross the Mediterranean into Europe. Staying on the African continent here, um, so 88% 88, 88 of the refugees crossing the Mediterranean uh, Sea are from Eritrea. While Eritrea is not at war, there are very serious human rights violations occurring there. A recent UN report uh, shows that the Eritrean government persistently uses torture, arbitrary detentions, enforced disappearances, forced labor, and indefinite military conscription as a way to rule the Eritrean populace. The country has no constitution or a functional court system, and the government controls almost every aspect of the people's lives there. So you can see this situation is very difficult for, for Eritreans living in the country, uh, and it has prompted thousands of them to seek refuge uh, in Europe and in other places within the region. So when you hear or you see pictures or videos of uh, refugees crossing the Mediterranean Sea, um, some of them are coming from Eritrea as well. Additionally, approximately 13% of the refugees crossing the Mediterranean are from Afghanistan. Um, many of us, I think, uh, we have kind of forgotten how 
even though there's no active war per se in Afghanistan, the country is still 80% unsafe. So a lot of people from Afghanistan, some who have been impacted by uh, some of the uh, uh, conflicts that have been ongoing among different uh, extreme groups, uh, some of whom have never been able to to find safety since uh, the invasion of the U.S. military there, try to find safety elsewhere. And uh, they make their way uh, through other countries like Iran, uh, Iraq, Turkey, and then cross the Mediterranean Sea into Europe. Uh, and last but not least, the Central American refugee crisis we saw last summer is still ongoing as well. There's gang violence epidemic in in the countries in Central America, particularly the Northern Triangle countries, uh, which are Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. Thousands of families have been killed by gang members. And for many people, the choice is to either flee or stay and potentially die from gang violence. Now, you don't see a lot of um, images in the media as we see last we saw last summer uh, of children and families coming trying to get into the United States but it doesn't mean it's not happening uh, what's happening now uh, countries uh, like Mexico and Costa Rica are receiving many of these refugees and actually some of them who are trying to get to the United States um, are returned at the Mexican border point and they are not able to make their way here. So this is just a sampling of countries that are producing uh, refugees uh, at the, in the current uh, crisis. There are others uh, that I wanted to list that are also uh, we call source countries. Uh, basically meaning countries that produce refugees. Um, this includes Iraq, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Somalia, Burundi, Central African Republic, and Burma. So um, not all um, refugees are seeking uh, safety in Europe or in, in the United States, as I mentioned, in the case of Central America. Um, in Middle East, uh, countries uh, such as Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey uh, are also uh, what we call host countries uh, or destination countries for refugees. And they're really uh, having to deal with a lot of these refugees. In, in the continent of Africa, you have uh, South Africa, Kenya and Ethiopia, as I mentioned, uh, Tanzania, Niger, and then the Democratic Republic of Congo is kind of a unique country in a sense because while it's a, it's a source country for refugees, it's also a destination for other refugees from the region who end up in camps within uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo's borders. Uh, and these these refugees uh, come from areas like Burundi uh, and other countries surrounding there. So uh, at this point, I will turn it over uh, to Alison for our next presentation. Thank you so much, Patricia. It's so important to remember the, the many and varied reasons why refugees are fleeing their homelands and to remember the significant burden that refugee hosting countries are experiencing, to remember our own responsibility as a resettlement country to support the international response to the situation. We'll talk now about the durable solutions that the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees is charged with finding for any refugee population. 
the first goal and hope and priority for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees is repatriation. When a country stabilizes, the persecution that individuals were experiencing is no longer an issue. The hope is that refugees can repatriate. When that option is not possible, the second option for refugees is local integration. This requires the cooperation and the ability of the host country, the country of first asylum, to incorporate and integrate refugees into their economy, into their systems, into their schools, et cetera. That's the second goal. The third possibility is resettlement to a third country. This is the last option for refugees, and many wait years and decades in refugee camps awaiting the hope of resettlement when the former two opportunities are no longer available to them. Less than one half of 1% of all refugees will ever be resettled. Of all refugees who are resettled, a large number come to the United States. The United States is the international leader in refugee resettlement, resettling more annually than all other refugee resettlement programs combined. In addition to the United States, Australia, Sweden, Norway, New Zealand, Canada, Finland, Denmark, and the Netherlands are considered traditional resettlement countries. Now you might wonder, what about the countries in Europe, like Germany and Belgium, that are seeing refugees at this point? Now, these countries are receiving refugees and are serving them in this immediate crisis response, but that does not necessarily mean that these countries have sophisticated or formalized refugee resettlement programs that allow refugees to integrate into the society and to eventually become citizens. We may see new countries come on board and establish resettlement programs with this current situation, but that does remain to be seen. This graphic we have borrowed from our colleagues at Churchfold Service. Churchfold Service operates the Resettlement Support Center in Nairobi, Kenya, and that's one of the places that Episcopal Migration Ministries visited with eight Episcopalians from across the church in our pilgrimage called Share the Journey, which happened in March of this year. So this graphic is used in cultural orientation classes for refugees before they make their way to the United States, and it represents for them the processes that they must go through to become part of the refugee resettlement program in the U.S. After they're identified by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, or UNHCR, refugees are then referred to a country for resettlement. Once they've been referred, in this case to the United States, they go through a process of interviews with the Resettlement Support Center. Now, as I mentioned, this graphic is from the Resettlement Support Center in, in Kenya, but there are resettlement support centers in regions throughout the world. After they pass through the RSC interviews, they move on to interviews, security clearances, and identity checks with the Department of Homeland Security, United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. So this is something Jen will talk about later in her presentation, but refugees undergo the most rigorous security screening of any individual who legally comes to the United States. So very important to remember. If the Department of Homeland Security approves them for resettlement, then refugees move on to medical examinations, which happen under the auspices of the International Organization for Migration, or ILM. They move on to cultural orientation within the country, and then ILM provides travel loans and arranges with partners in the United States for refugees travel to the U.S. After the reception in the United States, they go through a process of, um, of initial welcome and support, later employment services and other, other services to come around refugees to ensure their success and their integration. Another very cool thing about the IOM travel loan that I mentioned is that this travel loan is something that refugees start paying back after several months in the United States. And this helps refugees establish good credit so that later down the road they can buy a home, they can buy a car, they might be able to start their own small business. So that's a very cool thing that happens from the beginning is that refugees begin to build a financial history and credit, um, credit report here in the United States. The United States Refugee Admissions Program, or the USRAP, is an interagency effort and a public-private partnership. The two primary departments of the federal government that enact the program 
are called are the Department of State and the Department of Health and Human Services Administration for Children and Families. And we heard just on the last slide how the Department of Homeland Security works with the security clearance process for refugee processing before they travel to the country. Within the Department of State, the Bureau for Population, Refugees, and Migration operates a program called Reception and Placement, or RMP. And this provides funding and services for a refugee's first 30 to 90 days in the United States. And these, this program is enacted locally from a national agency through their local partners. The Department of Health and Human Services Office of Refugee Resettlement provides two programs that Episcopal Migration Ministries enact. One of those programs is called Matching Grant, or MG, and that's an intensive employment readiness program to help refugees become employed early so they can be self-sufficient. And the other program that EMM participates in is called Preferred Communities, and that is an intensive case management program for refugees with special medical and mental health needs. The Office of Refugee Resettlement also offers an array of discretionary grants to the local level to refugee resettlement organizations in cities and towns across the United States. These range from school impact grants to support the school systems that serve refugee students and youth, to agricultural grants to support refugees in community gardens and agricultural efforts. There are many more. The Domestic and Foreign Missionary Society, the Episcopal Church, is one of the nine national resettlement agencies that works in the public-private partnership that I mentioned with the federal government. It is Episcopal Migration Ministries that is the branch or the part of the Domestic and Foreign Missionary Society that enacts the Refugee Resettlement Ministry of the church. As I mentioned, Episcopal Migration Ministries participates in those three programs reception and placement, supporting a refugee's initial few months in the United States, matching grant, which supports intensive employment services to ensure refugees are employed and on the road to self-sufficiency, and preferred communities, providing intensive case management for medical and mental health needs. And we enact this through a partnership and a network with 30 local offices across the United States. This is a map that shows the countries from which refugees fled who came through Episcopal Migration Ministries and resettled in the United States in fiscal year 2014. And this map shows Episcopal Migration Ministries' national network of affiliate partners. So check and look and see if we have a location in your diocese, in your state, or near your diocese. One of the ways we try to very much encourage congregations to be involved in the work of welcoming is through cross-diocesan and inter-congregational partnerships. So not only are you working together to ensure that a family is welcomed, but you're learning about another congregation in the Episcopal Church, and it's building up the body of Christ and growing in fellowship together. This has worked so well in so many different areas, especially in domestic mission trips. It's a beautiful opportunity to make it work in the work of, in the Ministry of Resettlement as well. And this map shows the national map for all the refugee resettlement agencies, including Episcopal Migration Ministry. So you may see on this map a city in your state, or maybe just across the border, where there is local resettlement happening. I'm excited now to be turning the gears a little bit to the real meat and potatoes of our conversation tonight. My colleague Jen Smyers is going to walk us through some of the very important aspects of the Ministry of Advocacy as it relates to refugees. So Jen, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Allison, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, Church World Service is a very proud partner of Episcopal Migration Ministries and of the Episcopal Church more broadly. We work really closely as one of the nine refugee resettlement agencies in the United States. We're in 33 different offices in 22 states, and in many of those locations, we actually have joint sites with Episcopal Migration Ministries, so we work 
very, very closely together. Um, we also work within Refugee Council USA as well as within the Interfaith Immigration Coalition really in lockstep uh, with our Episcopal partners. So not only do we share many sites, but also so um, the two of our organizations, Episcopal Migration Ministries and Church World Service, work hand in hand with Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service as well as other refugee and immigration focused organizations. Um, so CWS in particular has 38 different Protestant, Anglican, and Orthodox communions and denominations. Uh, and we're proud that the Episcopal Church is, is one of them. So I'm going to move on and, uh, and kind of take a step back from um, the nitty gritty of refugees and immigration and talk about the very different ways that people are either welcomed or not welcomed. Um, I think when you look at this quote here, it's different when they're here in our backyard. That could very well be a quote that perhaps Hungarian or Austrian or German individuals are saying right now about Syrian refugees, people who perhaps last summer were looking at what was happening um, with so many Central American children and families seeking safety in the United States, and maybe they were saying, I can't believe the United States is not welcoming Central American children and families. Um, so actually, I've seen a lot of real similarities in how the U.S. sees the migrant crisis in the U.K. Uh, in a very similar way to how people in uh, the U.K. see our migrant crisis here. Um, and I think it's important to realize that those crises are faced by the migrants themselves. It's not really a, a crisis for the countries that are hosting refugees, uh, especially when those countries have so, so many means with which to do so. So as was mentioned, refugees are often labeled economic migrants at the very same time that they are seeking safety in nearby countries. So you know we're hearing Europe call a lot of Syrian refugees economic migrants. We're not hearing that as much in the United States. And then vice versa, we uh, heard a lot of people in the media and politicians calling Central American refugees economic migrants or just migrants. Uh, when the rest of the world very clearly saw them as refugees seeking safety uh, from violence. So specifically right now, um, but in nearly every migrant crisis, you see xenophobia and nationalism, as well as fear and a lack of understanding of who refugees are. And I think especially with the Syrian refugee crisis, we're seeing, unfortunately, a growth of anti-Muslim sentiment fuel anti-immigrant and anti-refugee sentiment. So moving on from there, um, when we talk about um, hostility versus hospitality, we also can talk about reality versus rhetoric. Uh, I think it's very important that as people of faith in particular, we educate our community members that it is legal, 100% legal, to seek access to safety to flee one's country and to seek protection and asylum. Specifically, the United States, as well as the majority of refugee hosting countries, are signatory to the 1951 Convention on the Status of Refugees. And it makes it very, very clear that it is absolutely not a crime to cross a border in order to seek safety and protection. So I hear a lot of people say, OK, but why are people coming this way? Why are people sending children on top of trains or putting their families in a boat um, or paying a smuggler to take them to a border? And the majority of these questions can be answered in part because there is not a timely and accessible way to seek refuge through current processes. So for instance, if we had a more accessible system or if Europe had a more accessible system where people, even in large numbers, could seek safety and access safety in a timely way to meet their very real and urgent needs, people would not have to resort to smugglers. But of course, what we're seeing now is many, many doors in Europe, many borders are closing, and then refugees are scrambling to come in before those countries close their borders. And similarly, when there is no visa process 
for you to come because our visa system is backlogged more than 10 years, uh, well, then people have to resort to more dangerous means of seeking safety. I think we all know this, uh, and it's part of why our hearts have called us to be on this webinar today, but refugees are not a burden. They are not a drain on our society. They are us, and we are them. They contribute to our society. Um, they enrich our understanding of the world. We have lost Jen's audio. Lacey, can you hear me? Are you able to speak to the audience? Yes, I can. Okay. By what we will do? Um, some. Ooh. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep, we can hear you now, Jen. Thanks so yeah. much. Hey, sorry, a little hiccup. Um, but the reason I don't like to sometimes talk about uh, the founder of Google or how many refugees are doctors is because we all know that someone's individual worth is not determined by their profession or their level of education or what job they have currently. Um, but it is true that many refugees certainly contribute um, economically and in other ways to our society. So moving to the next slide, um, I think that there is even a capacity myth. We just can't take this many refugees. Um, Europe is just being overwhelmed. And I think some numbers, although you know, I, numbers kind of make the eyes glaze over, but it's important to point out that all migration to the United States, including refugees, including immigration visas, including recent increases of families and children seeking safety from Central America, all of them amount to 0.0009% of the U.S. population. So we are in no way being overwhelmed, um, especially because we know of a model of scarcity or a gospel of scarcity, but a gospel of plenty. When you look at Europe, refugees arriving in Europe are 0.027% of the population. Again, a real fraction, and I think certainly the hospitality has been overwhelming, um, and these numbers are actually very small. I think it was one radio host who said, if every U.S. school district could accept six children fleeing violence in Central America, um, that certainly is, is something that we could do, uh, and that's you know, the impact that, it, that would be seen um, on various communities. I also think it's important to think about our domestic and foreign policies. More funds are spent on the deportation machinery of keeping people out, $13 billion every year, more than all federal law enforcement agencies combined. More funds are spent on that than on access to migration, refugee assistance, and integration programs, about $3 billion per year. Um, so I think it's important to see where uh, our priorities are as a nation. So let me shift to um, some specific information on Syrian refugees. We've already spoken about how there are 4 million refugees, 8 million internally displaced people. The region and neighbors of Syria are hosting about 3 million refugees. Germany has pledged to welcome a million refugees, and I think it's helpful to note that if you look at the size of each country's population, in proportion to our populations, this would be the equivalent of the United States welcoming 3 million Syrian refugees, what Germany has pledged to do. Uh, but in fact, the U.S. has only resettled 1,911 Syrians in the last five years, which is very, very small and certainly not indicative of us as um, usually one of the leaders in resettlement. So the White House has pledged to now resettle 10,000 Syrians. Uh, the media has taken this as a big step forward and a big increase, but in fact it's not. We were already planning, the U.S. was already planning to accept about 8,000 Syrian refugees, so this is a very small increase. Moving on to the next slide, we have seen some increase 
on the part of the White House to increase total refugee resettlement to 85,000 next or this fiscal year now, uh, and then 100,000 refugees in fiscal year 17. Um, but this is still very, very small. In the 1980s, we were resettling closer to 200,000 refugees every year, and we know that where there's a will, there's a way, and that it can be done. I think, unfortunately, like I mentioned before, a lot of anti-immigrant and anti-Muslim sentiment has fueled more anti-refugee proposals, which we'll get to in a second. So let me move on to um, some of the things that we're asking for. Um, we know that it is possible for us to resettle 200,000 refugees this year, including 100,000 Syrians, and that's our ask. We know that the United States can increase funding for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, to help Syrians abroad and to refer more Syrians for resettlement to the U.S. We know that there can be increased capacity for the Department of Homeland Security to interview and process Syrians. And there are some real creative solutions that are kind of in the weeds, so to speak, but there are uh, approximately 20,000 Syrians who have approved immigration petitions and are just awaiting their priority date. Syrians are arriving today who applied in 2008, 2008 to join their families here in the United States. So if we allow those individuals to be paroled in or to come through the refugee program and await their petition dates, that is one way that we could help a, a lot of people. We could also expand the Priority 3 Family Reunification Program, which right now only refugees can apply for their refugee family members abroad to join them. But if Syrian Americans were allowed to utilize this program, even if they came in through a work visa or a different means, um, then they could be reunited with their family members who are refugees abroad. And there is also a real need to increase resources. Uh, one of my favorite quotes recently has been from Senator Lindsey Graham from South Carolina, who said, if we don't accept more Syrian refugees, we might as well take the Statue of Liberty and tear it down. And absolutely, he's right. We need to make sure we're living up to our commitments. So I want to go through very quickly on funding, because we know resources are important. Um, that we all know that the government is now functioning on a continuing resolution, which is kind of a copy and paste job of the federal budget, uh, until December 11th. So we have between now and December 11th to push for more funds for refugee resettlement and refugee assistance overseas. And this is a real key moment. We will be working together to put out more action alerts and toolkits on how you can reach out to your members of Congress and push for more funds for the Department of State, for more funds for the Department of Homeland Security, and for the Office of Refugee Resettlement so that we can make sure more refugees can come in and also adequate services can be provided to make sure that they're being served well. And I, I think I uh, mentioned Senator Graham's leadership. He and Senator Leahy introduced a bipartisan piece of legislation to provide a billion dollars in addition to the usual funding of the State Department, specifically for refugee assistance and resettlement. I want to go through very briefly some positive legislation that are great ways uh, that you can ask your members of Congress to be supportive. The Protecting Religious Minorities Persecuted by ISIS Act would help religious minorities, ethnic minorities, as well as people fleeing gender-based violence in Syria and in Iraq. Both the Strengthening Refugee Resettlement Act, the Refugee Protection Act, as well as the longest title, the Domestic Refugee Resettlement Reform and Modernization Act, all would help improve the refugee program and the welcome that refugees receive by expanding important programs that help refugees integrate and thrive when they're in the United States. I want to flag two negative pieces of legislation next. And these are important. We don't need to talk about these first and draw more attention to them. But it's important for you to know they exist and to be able to respond to them. One is the Resettlement Accountability National Security Act, unfortunately has not gotten a lot of attention, but it would basically stop all refugee resettlement to the United States. The second is a piece of legislation that unfortunately is really picking up steam, and that's the Refugee Resettlement Oversight and Security Act. This would make it so that unless Congress passes a joint resolution every year 
about the number of refugees to be admitted, the entire program would stop or be on hold. And I think very, very much of concern to the religious community is that it would say, for refugees from Iraq and from Syria, we should only bring in religious minorities, which we can read between the lines. These are Muslim-majority countries would keep Muslim refugees from accessing the refugee resettlement program. So we have a letter um, that we'll make sure is in the follow-up materials, more than 400 religious leaders who are saying that they are against anything that would restrict access to the country uh, for, for uh, refugees, making sure that we can resettle refugees of all different religions. Um, and then very briefly, before I kick it over, because I think I'm running a little over time, um, just some helpful points. Like Allison said, refugees are the most scrutinized and vetted individuals to come to the U.S. They go through biometric, biographic, medical screening processes, interagency screening checks, um, and they also go through in-person interviews with the Department of Homeland Security. It's important to lift up your, everyone's role uh, in refugee resettlement, that communities, schools, congregations, employers welcome refugees, and that well, refugees then contribute back to their communities. Um, so in terms of our asks, just to really recap on the last slide here, um, we are asking the administration to do their part to increase refugee resettlement to reduce how long it takes for refugees to come to the United States and to request more money from Congress to make sure refugees receive the welcome they deserve. And then from Congress, we want them to support more refugees. We want them to support these positive pieces of legislation. And we want them to affirm how important the program is by voting against any negative legislation, as well as making sure that they are providing funding to make sure refugees are resettled with dignity. So I'm going to now pass it over to Lacey, who's going to get more in detail about how we can all lift up our voices for these issues. Okay. So how can we help refugees? As Jen just made it clear, it's very critical um, to have advocacy as a part of that. So I'm going to talk to you about the Episcopal Church's Ministry of Advocacy. And the main way lay and ordained Episcopalians can advocate together is with the Episcopal Public Policy Network, or the EPPN, which is how I will refer to it today. Uh, so what is the EPPN? The EPPN is a grassroots network of Episcopalians dedicated to, dedicated to striving for justice and peace and taking action on issues of social justice. We address issues at a federal level, and we work on issues that are um, official resolutions passed by executive council or general convention. So why should you join? First and foremost, in our baptismal covenant, we promise to strive for justice and peace and respect the dignity of all human beings. So we have a baptismal mandate to advocate for a world much more like God's vision for it. Second of all, the time is now. Um, as we hear anti-refugee or anti-immigrant rhetoric, especially during the 2016 election, which is getting in full swing, it's critical that candidates and our elected officials know that we're a welcoming nation and that there are welcoming communities across our country. And, you know, as we've heard just in the presentations before this, is that millions of refugees are in danger and are actively seeking a better life as we speak. So third, your faith voice makes a difference. Um, members of Congress track all interactions with their constituents, whether it's a call, email, or a meeting. And if you can speak critically, or excuse me, if you can speak clearly and confidently about why your views of protecting and supporting refugees are inspired by your faith, that will set your call, email, or meeting apart. And finally, the EPPN is a community of advocacy. Um, it's a supportive network that can provide you with the resources, the intel, and the access needed for advocacy to happen. So how do you take action with the EPPN? So advocacy does take many forms. The most common form that EPPN members use is contacting their members of Congress directly via email. You'll see here this is a screenshot of our action center, which is advocacy.episcopalchurch.org, and you'll get that link. Uh, later in your follow-up materials. 
we have a take action section there, which you can see on the main part, which is really what we're talking about today. So our staff members write background information uh, and get you up to speed on legislation. We communicate with our members via email. So you'll receive an email uh, that says, you know, here's a piece of legislation, might be something, one of those, uh, one of those pieces of legislation that Jen just mentioned. We'll give you a little bit of a background, why the Episcopal Church is taking action on it, and we also write a sample letter for you to send to your member of Congress. So then you'll come to our website. You will enter your information, your contact information, so our system sends the message directly to your correct member of Congress. And you can read the letter here, you can edit the letter, you can add to it, and then you send it. This particular uh, action alert that I have right now is up on the screen is the one that's on our website right now. Some of you may have already taken action, and I thank you for that. And if you haven't, you can go to our website and, and go ahead and do that tonight. Um, it's, it's a pretty quick and easy system. So there are a few other ways you can take act. Uh, uh, you can take part in advocacy. As I mentioned, the most common way is you know through our action center, emailing your members of Congress. But the other way is through direct advocacy or meeting with your member with your elected officials and their staff in person. And I want you to remember, you do not have to come to D.C. to do this. In fact, it can be highly influential to meet with your members of Congress at home. And you can host a meeting anytime, but we're asking advocates to meet with their members of Congress while they are in district, in your home, on November 9th through 13th. After this webinar, you'll receive a local advocacy guide written by our partners, Refugee Council USA. And that toolkit will give you everything you need to assist you in setting up a meeting at home, which includes um, you know, how to contact your members of Congress to schedule the meeting, how to prepare stories, how to follow up at, afterwards. And to, the most critical part is getting a group of advocates together. You could partner with a refugee in your community, bring a priest, bring your bishop to tell your faith story and make it clear that this is an issue deeply important to the people in your community. Other options for advocacy, which I think are really fun, is tweeting at your member of Congress. Um, members are increasingly um, you know, tracking tweets from their constituents that they get a high number. I, you know, here's a screenshot of an example here. You can also call your members of Congress or the White House. Those calls are also tracked. Here are the numbers to use. Um, and here's also a, a quick um, script that you could use if you make that call. Finally, an important part of advocacy is spreading awareness and identifying stories. Before you advocate, you need to know the facts and details about an issue. And while participating in this webinar, you've learned a great deal of information. You are now equipped to teach others about the refugee crisis. You can inspire others by sharing facts and realities about the refugee crisis while also telling your faith story to help ask them to join you in action. And we're here to help you spread this word, whether it is writing a letter to, to the editor, hosting a Sunday forum, um, creating flyers or bulletin inserts, or helping you get on social media to join the advocacy, you know, the conversation online. And some of you have already been tweeting tonight, and I thank you for that, using these hashtags. So you each have a story to tell, and each action, no matter how small, can make a difference. Your voice is needed as we work together to welcome the stranger and care for every living being. And the Episcopal Church is already actively doing that, so I'm excited for you all to join us in this mission. Here are a list of resources that you'll get in your follow-up. I want you to also know that if you don't know who your elected officials are, on our website, we have a box, a tool, where you type in your zip code and you get all the information on your elected officials, including contact information. Um, from your local officials all the way up to your federal level. You can also join national advocates um, with the Refugee Council USA advocacy calls. The next one is noon Eastern, Friday, November 7th. I really encourage you to join this um, if you're looking for a way to connect with others um, to keep this momentum up of what you're interested in doing and, and advocating and being a part of this ministry. To sign up today for EPPN Action Alerts, I remember I said that we communicate to you mainly through email, so we'll get your contact information, your email address, and you'll start receiving emails from us about once a week. Um, here's my email address and phone number. I'm really looking forward 
uh, to hearing from you all, and we are eager to partner with you. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn it back to Allison. Great. Thanks so much, Lacey. And thank you, Jen. It's so important to remember, especially for congregations who really want to participate in welcoming and co-sponsoring a family, that without the work of advocacy, there may be no refugees to welcome to your community. So please do get out there and engage in this prophetic ministry of advocacy. Now we're going to turn our attention to mission and service to welcome refugees. As you can probably imagine, there are a variety of activities and services involved in local resettlement. And while the same regulations govern the program nationally, local agencies with their national agency partners engage in this work in very unique ways. Local agencies will resettle specific populations to your area. They'll have impressive capacity amongst their staff members, including a variety of languages, upwards of 24 or more languages and some refugee resettlement staff. They'll also have unique pro approaches to the work, including how they incorporate community support and volunteers to benefit their clients and to ensure their long-term self-sufficiency and their integration. And of course, just as these agencies and the refugees they welcome are unique, you and your community of faith are unique. And you've got your own individual and collective gifts to bring to this ministry of welcome. So I'd like to frame the conversation in that way around this idea of gift discernment. God gives each of us unique skills and assets to be used in sharing God's love with the world. And part of your work as you engage in resettlement is to uncover those many and diverse gifts and figure out how can you offer them in partnership to welcome new Americans. If you or your congregation are feeling a call to participate in the work of Welcome, you are also being called into relationships with the staff of the local agency, with other community partners, perhaps interfaith or ecumenical partners, as well as with the refugee families that you will welcome and walk alongside. One of the greatest gifts you can offer in this partnership is a clear understanding of what you bring to the table. So we would really encourage you to go through a process of gift discernment. This will allow you to approach the work from an asset-based approach as opposed to a needs-based approach. Jen spoke eloquently earlier about coming from a place of plenty, um, for a theology of abundance. And that's the place that we should enter into this work as opposed to a place of scarcity. By wearing this lens of abundance, it will allow you not only to look inside your faith community and your congregation with new eyes, seeing it brimming with possibility and creativity, but it will also allow you to see others and the gifts they bring to the work, as well as the skills, the resilience, and the determination of the refugees that you will welcome as your neighbors. We work together in this. Refugee resettlement is a true community building exercise. You work together encouraging one another, and you strive to support a family's journey towards self-sufficiency and independence. Gift discernment can be done individually. It's a very fun exercise for you to kind of discover things about yourself you might not have known. And it can also be done collectively. In a group, it can be a really enriching Christian formation or discipleship experience and can help individuals in your group coalesce into a strong team. We have several resources we can send to you. We're not going to be releasing them to every attendee to the webinar, but we will release them to congregations and their representatives that email us and let us know that you'd like these things. We have a gift discernment activities resource, 10 best practices for congregations engaging in this work, a checklist for congregations that kind of gives you a step-by-step -step phases of how to engage in the work as well as we want to direct you tonight to Call to Transformation, this wonderful website that is an offering of the Domestic and Foreign Missionary Society and Episcopal Relief and Development. And what Call to Transformation does is it pairs the concept of asset-based community development, or ABCD, which many of you may be familiar with, with the scriptures, the traditions, and the theology of the Episcopal Church. So we commend all of these things to you, and those first three bullet points there, if you'd like to receive those resources, please send me an email, and those will be coming to you shortly. So what are the many things that are part of refugee resettlement? Well, welcome begins long before refugees arrive. 
National agencies work with international partners to plan for their travel. And while that's happening at the local level, agencies are arranging for decent, safe, and sanitary housing, for furniture, cleaning supplies, toiletries, seasonal clothing, and clothing for work. So if your congregation were to help in the work of welcoming before arrival, it could very much look like a shower, a welcome shower, where you provide all the needs for a family upon arrival. At arrival, case managers and other staff of the agency will greet refugees at the airport. You can participate in that too. That's one of the most fun ways to see the emotional, um, to feel the emotion and the joy of resettlement as a family comes to this country. You can also participate by preparing a ready-to-eat and culturally appropriate meal for the family upon arrival. That is a requirement of the Refugee Resettlement Program, and it's a really wonderful and beautiful way for you to get to know something about the culinary culture of the refugee family and to prepare something that will nourish them and their bodies upon arrival. And welcome to an orientation to the new community. Lots of things happen. Case managers of the agency will assist in applying for social security cards, enrollment in language programs, and other services. They'll ensure refugees receive a health assessment, transportation assistance, and filing for um, filing for family overseas to join them. But in any of those activities, there's many ways that you can be involved. So we'll take a look at those right now. Beyond the requirements of the program, local agencies have a plethora of ways that they ensure that refugees are, um, are connected to their communities, that they're learning English, that they're feeling um, like they're a vital and contributing part of their new home. So think with me, just kind of imagine the ways in which you and your congregation can participate. You can serve as assistance for cultural orientation, English and citizenship classes. Our partner in Atlanta called New American Pathways, which is also a local affiliate of Church Full Service, has an amazing program called Mentors for Vocational Pathways. And the MVP program pairs Atlanta-based professionals with refugees who come with a vibrant career background and are professionals in their fields. And it pairs them for mentorship to assist the refugee as they become certified in the proper processes to achieve that level in their career here in the United States. You can participate in young adult leadership circles, in art therapy, and children's choirs. So if you've got some musical or artistic talent, it's a great way to contribute. Many refugees come from countries with strong agricultural um, backgrounds. And so to provide space or to engage with refugees in a community garden can be enormously therapeutic. And um, it can make them feel very connected to their new home. So think, if you at your congregation have some vacant land, or if you could establish in a parking lot some raised bed gardening. Imagine what that could do for the work of welcome and for refugees integrating into your community. If you've got vacant space in your church building, you could host classes, refugee community worship services, and other agency activities. It can be a game changer for some local agencies if they have space just to store all the donations that they receive. So think creatively about that. If you were able to provide storage space for a local agency, that would open up space with their, within their office to serve more clients, to offer classes, ESL, and all these types of things. So that can be a great way to support. You can simply invite your new neighbors to community activities, introduce them to the fun and the uniqueness that it is to live in your community. If you have a vehicle, you can donate a vehicle. You can offer low-cost housing options if you have a vacant rectory or other building that can be used for housing and is zoned appropriately. And finally, so many congregations and dioceses have vibrant ministries to their wider communities that refugees can connect into. Perhaps you have summer camps or, lit summer camps or literacy programs that children can attend. Perhaps food pantries and clothing closets not only that refugees can use as resources, but spaces where they can volunteer and contribute and give back and feel like they are a part of their community. And finally, beyond the work of service, there's many ways that you can give financially, material goods, and your time to assist local agencies. Please look up your nearest Episcopal Migration Ministries affiliate partner or your nearest local resettlement agency and make a donation. Provide supplies. They'll give you a list. The local agency will provide you a list of the items that they need, be they welcome baskets or winter coats for refugees who arrive in the cold of winter. Of course, volunteer your time, even if it's to support staff members who work so hard and with such passion, and it's working in the office. 
you have no idea how much that changes the game for people engaged in this work to know that they're supported and that you care for them and for the work that they do to welcome refugees. And finally, Episcopal Relief and Development is doing some emergency response work abroad in partnership with many partners, including Islamic Relief, which is working in Lesbos, Greece. So they're an important partner to contribute if you want to respond to the refugee crisis in Europe. And now we are moving into the question and answer, answer part of the evening. So I'll turn it over to my colleague and friend, Wendy. Great, thank you, Allison. So we have had a couple of questions, and so much fun, they came through on Twitter. So those were fun to see. Thanks to everyone who joined us on Twitter and who was interacting with us over the course of the evening. So we had a question from uh, Twitter handle Father Jim Bimby, and he is asking, why does it take up to seven years for some refugees to be processed? And I don't know, maybe, maybe that's Jen. Is that a good question for you? Sure, it's a really good question. So there are multiple reasons why the processing can take far too long. The security check process is very complex and each part of the security check process has a very strict validity period. So if even one of these checks are delayed because a Department of Homeland Security officer maybe can't get a visa to do the interviews, then everything else starts to expire and refugees have to do other security checks over again, maybe two or three times. If we are members of a family and one of our security checks expires because something's gotten held up um, or we have a similar name that takes additional information to clear, then other people in the family's checks begin to expire and then you're in this domino effect of expiring validity periods. Um, oftentimes, though, um, the holdup is even before that. Um, I, like Allison said, less than half of 1% of the world's refugees have access to resettlement. And so people can languish in camps and in urban situations before they ever have an opportunity to be resettled because of the very, very small numbers of refugees who are actually ever resettled. Um, and then in addition to that, as people wait processes for family reunification, the waits for some of those visas can be very, very long. So all of those contribute to um, the holdup. I think in terms of what we can do, a lot of it is political will. If there's a political will to move things faster, to admit more refugees, um, to have more funding for refugees who are awaiting the process, uh, to access school and jobs and livelihoods, then that can happen, and that's a very powerful way through our advocacy that we can really educate people about how difficult the process is and educate our government officials about the need to change it. Um, Jen, just as a follow-up question, someone asked if security checks are the same regardless of which country refugees are coming from. Great question, and the answer is no. Um, there are different security checks depending on where people are coming from. With security checks, I will admit that there is more that I don't know than what I do know. Uh, we know that there are agencies in the government that no one even knows the acronyms for who go through some of these checks. Um, but it is the case that some populations take a much longer time to process which is one of the reasons we've been told by the government there are so few Syrians is because there's so much more security uh, that takes place with that population. But interestingly, just today, I was in a meeting where the White House said, we know that this is a problem, that it's taking too long, and we've heard from people, and we're going to try to speed up the process. Still do all the checks, but do them smarter. And I think it really shows where that political will is there. Um, but the checks can be different in terms of which name checks happen um, and in which sequence, depending on what region of the world. Great, thanks, Jen. Um, I have another question, and they're asking, this might be for you, Allison, how can youth and young adults be involved in this ministry? That's a great question. So there are many opportunities for internships and kind of 
longer term or intensive volunteer opportunities at many local resettlement offices. But it's interesting to know, I think, that many young adult refugees who come to this country often come without family members. If you think back to um, the Lost Boys of Sudan, um, that population, some came as unaccompanied children, but also some came as youth and young adults without their family members, having lost them um, in massacres and various other situations. So it's important to know young adults come as refugees. They're vibrant, they're resilient, they're survivors, and they want to connect to their communities. You know, they want to find work, they want to find friends, they want to enroll in school and seek higher education. So they're in many ways just like the rest of us. They have a depth of experience and background, um, but they're looking for friends and they're looking for community. So one of the best ways young adults can engage in the work is to volunteer at the local organization and to, to make it clear that they, they want to be a friend, they want to be a connector, they want to be welcoming to other young adults who are coming through the refugee program. So then, you know, invite them, invite them to community activities, invite them to, to festivals and other things to get them connected and feeling the, the vibe of the fabric of the local community. That's a really beautiful way for young adults to be involved. Thanks, Allison. Um, I think I'm going to give one last question, and then um, I'm going to encourage anyone who has questions after this point, because we've already gone over by 20 minutes, and I want to be careful of everyone's time. So um, you can certainly, Allison is going to put up on the screen our email addresses and phone numbers, and you're certainly welcome to call any or email any of us if you have any questions. Um, but one last question for, I think this is just maybe for Lacey. Um, someone asked, they were saying that they they saw that you've um, that the presidential determination was 85,000 refugees for this fiscal year, but you're requesting that they admit more refugees. How is it possible if the determination has already been made? So actually, Jen, do you want to take that one and just sort of talk about the delineations there between Syrian refugees and what our ask is at the moment? Yes, absolutely. So this is a great question. So the presidential determination has to be set um, at the very, very end or very beginning of each fiscal year. So the government fiscal year is October 1, which is why it was just set. But historically, there have been many, many situations, including um, after the fall of the Soviet Union, after um, the, Viet the war in Vietnam, um, even Iraqi refugees, where there have been addendums to the presidential determination, where because of a world event or because of more political pressure, the presidential determination has been revised at various parts of the year. So specifically, we're trying to really push for 100,000 Syrians in addition to the current PD. Um, specifically because we know that there is so much momentum around Syrians, there's so much need when it comes to Syrians, and I think that the White House has even signaled um, kind of a, okay, now make us do it kind of thing, that they're really looking for the, the political cover from so much public support if they're going to do this. I think there's a, actually a very real way that we could see that increase. I think it's very similar to in 1980. Um, we just brought in 200,000 Vietnamese refugees on top of all other populations. Um, so certainly where there's a will, there's a way, and it can be done. Thank you, Jen. And like I said, we're going to um, close the questions with that, and I'm going to turn it over to Allison for some closing thoughts. Well, it's been a great blessing for all of us to, to be together and to be with all of you tonight. We have all received hundreds and hundreds of inquiries over the past several weeks from across the Episcopal Church with people wanting to help. So thank you, and please keep the questions coming. I know that many of you have already emailed me to request those resources I mentioned for congregations, so keep those emails coming. And if you've got questions, here's our names and our contact information and the, um, the, the teams within the Domestic and Foreign Missionary Society where we serve, as well as Jen, our colleague from Church World Service. We're so glad you could join us, Jen. So please reach out to us, be in touch. We are here to serve you and to equip you for ministry. So we love to hear from you across the church. And here to end are our website addresses. 
Episcopal Migration Ministries is found at episcopalchurch.org slash EMM. And as Lacey mentioned earlier, you can connect with the Advocacy Ministry of the Episcopal Church at advocacy.episcopalchurch.org. God bless all of you, and good night. Thank you.